the House will come to order. Today, the Pledge of Allegiance will be led by Representative McLaughlin, House District 59. Please join me in the pledge. Mr. Shebo, please call the roll. Representatives Amabile. Excused. Armagost. Bacon. Rep Bacon. Excused. Bird. Bockenfeld. Excused. Basenecker. Bottoms. Bradfield, Bradley, Brown, Catlin, Representative Catlin, excused, oh, Clifford, Doherty, DeGraff is excused, Degree Kennedy, Speaker Pro Tem Degree Kennedy, excused, Duran, English is excused. Epps. Representative Epps. Excused. Evans. Frizzell. Froelich. She's there. Garcia. Hamrick. Hartsook. Hernandez. Rep Hernandez. Excused. Herod. Holtorf, Judah, Joseph, Kip, Leader, Lindsay, Lindstead, Luck, here, Lukens, Lynch, Mabry, Marshall, Martinez, Marvin, Morrow, McCormick, McLaughlin, Ortiz, Parenti, Puglisi, Ricks is excused, Rutnell, Representative Rutnell, excused, Sirota, Snyder, he was, he's back there, Soper, Rep. Soper. Excused. Story. I think she's late. Rep. Story. Excused. Taggart. Titone. Valdez A. Here. Velasco. Vigil. Weinberg. Weissman. Wilford. Wilson, Winter, Woodrow, Young, and Madam Speaker. Here. With 56 present, nine excused, we do have a quorum. Representative McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today I'm going to um, do part two of my travel log of House District 59. Durango has a 99-year-old coal-fired narrow-gauge train, an amazing piece of history. Uh, just last week, the owner converted the final coal engine to oil and steam. The train looks and sounds the same, but is much friendlier to the environment. Um, they have trains all summer and at the Polar Express in the winter, so bring your kids, it's a lot of fun. And I move that the Journal of Monday, April 8th, be approved as corrected by the Chief Clerk. Thank you. Members, you've heard the motion that the journal be approved as corrected by the Chief Clerk. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. Members, we do need to get to work. I'll invite everyone to take their seat.
Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move to proceed out of order for consideration of Senate amendments. Seeing no objection, we will proceed out of order for consideration of Senate amendments. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move to lay over House Bill 1037 and House Bill 1161 to Wednesday, April 10th, 2024. Seeing no objection, House Bill 1037 and 1161 will be laid over until tomorrow, Wednesday, April 10th. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move House Bill 1392, House Bill 1409, and House Bill 1425 to the end of the consideration of Senate amendments calendar. Seeing no objection, the bills listed by the Majority Leader will be moved to the end of the consideration of Senate amendments calendar. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1390. House Bill 1390 by Representatives Byrd and Sirota, also Senators Kirkmeyer and Bridges, concerning measures to support certain school food programs in the Department of Education and in connection therewith, making and reducing an appropriation. Representative Byrd. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the House concur with Senate amendments to House Bill 1390. Uh, Representative Byrd. Representative Byrd, I'm going to ask you to restate your motion. I believe you missed a word. Okay, so I move... Oh, Madam Speaker, I move that the House not concur. There we go. Oh, oh yes. Thank you. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, you can, you can um, do the gobbles at me later. But for this particular bill, I move that the House and, not yes. concur with Senate amendments to House Bill 1390 and request that a conference committee be appointed. Uh, thank you, Representative Byrd. Good motion. Please proceed. Um, thank you. So, uh, Madam Speaker and members, on second reading, the Senate adopted some amendments that required additional uh, meetings and collaborations with the advisory group that's created by this bill. We don't understand why and would like to work it out. So, we ask for your yes vote. Representative Holtorf. and to the bill sponsor, on such a glorious day where we push back and say to the Senate, no way, we should be celebrating. Now, I know that Representative Clifford has an amazing turkey call. I want to know how you play that backwards because we need to celebrate with a loud and thunderous and mighty no to the Senate. So this is a great day. Let's push back against them and tell them H-E double hockey sticks, no. I, I don't know if thanks are in order after that one, Rep. Holtorf, but uh, appreciate you standing up for the House. Uh, seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is to not concur with Senate amendments to House Bill 1390. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Luck, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Luck votes yes. Representative Valdez, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Valdez votes yes. Please close the machine. With 60 aye, one no, and four excuse, the motion to not concur is adopted. Representatives Byrd as chair, Sirota and Taggart will be appointed to the conference committee. Representative Byrd. Oh, Mr. Schiebel does have to read the title first. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1410. House Bill 1410 by Representatives Byrd and Taggart, also Senators Bridges and Zenzinger, concerning administrative changes to the Just Transition Office in the Department of Labor and Employment. Representative Byrd. Thank you. Uh, Madam Speaker, I move that the House not concur with Senate amendments to House Bill 1410. Please and proceed. And request that oh. a conference committee be appointed. Please explain. 
Okay, so um, members, the Senate Appropriations Committee reversed the amendments that we made and also um, added a date when they were going to sweep back money that was appropriated for the purposes set forth in this bill, counter to the wishes of this chamber, and I am therefore requesting, um, again, your support where we not concur and we instead go to conference committee. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is to not concur with Senate amendments to House Bill 1410. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Luck, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Luck votes yes. Representative Valdez, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Valdez votes yes. Amabile, please close the machine. With 60 aye, one no, four excuse, the motion to not concur is adopted. <laughs> Representatives Byrd as chair, Sirota and Taggart will be appointed to the conference committee. Mr. Shebo, please read the title to 1422. Sorry, 1413. House Bill 1413 by Representatives Bird and Taggart, also Senators Kirkmeyer and Bridges, concerning transfers from funds that include severance tax revenue and a connection there with making appropriation. Representative Bird. Thank you again, Madam Speaker. I move that the House not concur with Senate amendments to House Bill 1413 and request that a conference committee be appointed. Please proceed. Um, Madam Speaker, members, um, the Senate was more generous and appropriated more money out of the severance tax, um, the perpetual base fund. So we are wanting to go and have a discussion about that, and we ask for your support. The motion before us is to not concur with Senate amendments to House Bill 1413 uh, and appoint a conference committee. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Luck, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Luck votes yes. Representative Valdez, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Valdez votes yes. Please close the machine. With 60 aye, one no, four excuse, the motion to not concur is adopted. Representatives Byrd as chair, Sirota and Taggart will be appointed to the conference committee. Now, Mr. Schiebel, House Bill 1422. House Bill 1422 by Representatives Byrd and Taggart, also Senator Zenzinger and Kirkmeyer, concerning the cost threshold of controlled maintenance projects for capital re renewal. Representative Byrd. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the House not concur with Senate amendments to House Bill 1422 and request that a conference committee be appointed. Please proceed. Thank you. Um, Madam Speaker, members, the Senate adopted two amendments to the bill, um, changing the um, inflation measure that is or used in computations for um, capital renewal projects and also changed thresholds for capital renewal projects, different from what we approved here. So we ask for your yes vote. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is to not concur with Senate amendments to House Bill 1422 and go to conference committee. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Luck, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Luck votes yes. Representative Valdez, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Valdez votes yes. Armagas, Degree Kennedy, Holtorf. Please close the machine. With 61 I, zero no, four excuse, the motion to not concur is adopted. Representatives Byrd as chair, Sirota and Taggart will be appointed to the conference committee. Finally, Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1430. House Bill 1430 by Representative Byrd, also Senator Zenzinger, concerning the provision for payment of the expenses of the executive, legislative, and judicial departments of the state of Colorado and of its agencies and institutions for and during the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2024, except as otherwise noted. Representative Byrd. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I move that the House not concur with Senate amendments to House Bill 1430 and request that a conference committee be appointed and that the committee be given permission to go beyond the scope of the bill. Please proceed. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, this is the long bill, and the Senate went, or the Senate, well, it should be the Senate. The Senate went on a spending spree, so it is the Senate, actually. And we need to take corrective action, so we need your support here because, remember, we brought you a balanced budget and they, they kind of went out of control. So um, I ask for your support. <laughs> that was good. That was really good. <laughs> Members, the motion before us is to not concur with Senate amendments to House Bill 1430, appoint a conference committee, and go beyond the scope of the amendments and bill. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Luck, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Luck votes yes. Representative Valdez, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Valdez votes yes. Holtorf. Please close the machine. With 58 I, three no, and four excused, the motion to not concur with Senate amendments, go to conference committee, and go beyond the scope is adopted. <laughs> Representatives Bird as chair, Sirota, and Taggart will be appointed to the conference committee. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1392. House Bill 1392 by Representatives Burton Taggart, also Senators Kirkmeyer and Bridges, concerning revising the fourth year innovation pilot program and a connection therewith, limiting local education provider and school participation and adding program evaluation requirements. Representative Bird. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the House concur with Senate amendments, I know, to House Bill 1392. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Sorry to do this, colleagues, but they actually came up with a fairly decent amendment here. On second reading, the Senate adopted Amendment L001, which requires the Department of Education to disaggregate data related to the program based on local education provider type, in addition to criteria already specified in the bill. I think the amendment gives us better data, so I ask for your support. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is to concur with Senate amendments to House Bill 1392. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Luck, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Luck votes yes. Representative Valdez, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Valdez votes yes. Please close the machine. With 61 ayes, zero no, four excused, the motion to concur is adopted. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move for the repassage of House Bill 1392 as amended. The motion before us is the repassage of House Bill 1392 as amended. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Luck, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Luck votes yes. Representative Valdez, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Valdez votes yes. Please close the machine. With 61 ayes, zero no, four excused, House Bill 1392 as amended is repassed. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1409. House Bill 1409 by Representatives Burton Sirota, also Senators Bridges and Zenzinger, concerning the funding of employment related services in the state through the Department of Labor and Employment and in connection therewith making and reducing appropriations. Representative Byrd. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the House concur with Senate amendments to House Bill 1409. Please proceed. So, members, I know, 
I, I would be with you, but ordinarily, um, ordinarily I would be with you, but here again, they came up with a good amendment, a technical correction to the bill to change the one word department in one instance to the word enterprise. So I ask for your support. Representative Holtorf. Madam Speaker, our glory is diminishing as we give in to the sleepy Senate chamber. Please stand strong and do not let the old sleepy folks across the hall give us their gall. There has been some poetry. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is to concur with Senate amendments to House Bill 1409. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Luck, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Leck votes yes. Representative Valdez, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Valdez votes yes. Please close the machine. With 48 aye, 13 no, and four excuse, the motion to concur is adopted. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move for the repassage of House Bill 1409 as amended. The motion before us is the repassage of House Bill 1409 as amended. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Luck, how do you vote? No. Representative Luck votes no. Representative Valdez, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Valdez votes yes. Rep. Catlin. Please close the machine. With 46 I, 15 no, and four excused, House Bill 1409 as amended is repassed. Co sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to House Bill 1425. House Bill 1425 by Representatives Burden Sirota, also Senators Bridges and Kirkmeyer, concerning transfers of money for capital construction. Representative Byrd. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the House concur with Senate amendments to House Bill 1425. Please proceed. Thank you, uh, members. I feel like I should have done this in reverse because we'd be going out on a high note, but um, I think these are fair amendments that the Senate offered. Um, the Appropriations Committee, um, actually second, the Senate adopted Amendment L014, which adds guidance regarding scenarios under which the state treasurer is and is not permitted to transfer funds from the legal services cash fund to another fund, and um, they reduced the appropriation in this fund by a million dollars. So we ask for your yes vote. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is to concur with Senate amendments to House Bill 1425. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Luck, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Luck votes yes. Representative Valdez, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Valdez votes yes. Please close the machine. With 59 I to no for excuse, the motion to concur is adopted. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move for the repassage of House Bill 1425 as amended. The motion before us is the repassage of House Bill 1425 as amended. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Luck, how do you vote? No. Representative Luck votes no. Representative Valdez, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Valdez votes yes. Please close the machine. With 54 ayes, 7 no, 4 excused, the motion to repass House Bill 1425 as amended is adopted. Co-sponsors.
please close the machine. Well done, thank you, JBC. Our next order of business is third reading of bills. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Bill 68. Senate Bill 68 by Senator Janal, also Representative Brown, concerning end-of-life options for an individual with a terminal illness. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move Senate Bill 68 on third reading and final passage. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is the... I will ask members if you are interested in speaking that you be down in the well. Assistant Minority Leader Winter. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I appreciate you giving me that latitude. I apologize. No problem. Um, members, on this bill, I wasn't able to speak about it on, on too much on seconds. And I think this is an issue we talk about people's right to choose, but what kind of scares me, and I was chatting with my family a little bit the other day, is I'm not sure exactly what state, but it popped up in the news the other day that there was an individual, it might have been in Oregon or Washington, an individual that didn't have uh, illness or didn't have anything that was terminal um, and decided to end their own life. I think they were in their 20s. And it's just scary to me because I want to preserve life and I want to try to, I mean, you all know where we stand on that issue, but there's at some point where I want to be able to get these people help, and I understand that there are some people that are dealing with sickness, but this was one of the things that scared me when I read this bill is, is when's it going to be to a point where somebody we might be able to help that have a mental health issue or something where we can step in and be that first step? And it was just surprising to me because we were just discussing it in the chamber, and I'm sure you can all look it up. I wish I'd had time to pull the article, but it was really a, a, a national headline talking about the first individual ever to decide to go this route that didn't have a terminal illness. So it kind of opens the door for a lot of other things. I think this was some of the fears of what I heard in committee. I, I listened to committee. This was a bill that I took interest in. I actually sat in for part of the committee, and I know this is a very touchy subject for a lot of people, but it opens the door, like I said, it opens the door for people to make decisions and I know that there's a process that they go through and there's doctors that they have to talk to and that there's boxes they have to check here. But to know that somebody, and I know it isn't in the state of Colorado, but we always talk about how legislation can grow and change and just to know that there was an individual in their early 20s that have decided to use this option without a terminal illness is just concerning to me. So I just wanted to state that fact. Um, and. I would urge you all to be a no vote on this. Thank you. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Madam Speaker, esteemed colleagues, to the bill sponsor. He and I both share emotional scars in this space, I believe, based on testimony and discussion as many of us do who have watched our loved ones have to transition and go to the other side, the spiritual side of this world, where God reigns supreme and all his children are with him. This journey, end of life journey, is so difficult and so complicated and so full of emotions. One of the things that, it, that it came up in this committee, and as the ranking member, um, I sat and asked some very difficult questions of the sponsor that still has not been settled. And um, I would have, by the way, on Friday, if I would have been here, I would have ran second reading amendments which I have. And actually, I brought one forth today. And Madam Speaker, I need your leadership to determine and tell me when is the best time to run my third reading amendment. You may ask, sorry, Representative, you may ask uh, for permission to run a third reading amendment. Okay, and I will do that very soon. Thank you for your leadership, ma'am. Because there is one thing that is missing for those now, if you've ever held your grandmother's hand in those last days, and you speak to a woman that you've watched your whole life as a small child, and then you grow to a young adult, and then you are an adult, 
and she is very old, suffering with acute rheumatoid arthritis. Um, she has other medical issues, and she's sitting there living in your home with your stepfather and mother as they try to help her in this life's journey. And you, as a loving grandson, try to help her because it's very depressing. It's very sad. It's most sad and depressing for the person that is at the last chapter and perhaps the last pages of the book of their life. Now, I have no mental and behavioral health counseling. But what's most troubling in this bill is with respect to these individuals who are facing those last pages of their life book, that nobody in this legislation, there is nothing that says they should have or be afforded mental health counseling. How can we be so inconsiderate? How can we not offer them the same thing that we are offering to everybody else, including our youth, including adults, including veterans? If we really believe in behavioral and mental health counseling to everyone, to all, whether it's someone in their teen years, in their adult life, then we should allow this amendment. So with that, Madam Speaker, I ask for this chamber to give those the grace to consider an amendment that allows for that behavioral and mental health counseling opportunity to those people. The amendment is very short. I'm going to actually offer it and at this time, but at first I'm going to give it to the sponsor because out of fairness, he should see it. It's very simple. Very simple. Representative, just a reminder, the first step of the process is to ask for permission. I will remind the body that we are not in the final rules of session where substantive amendments may be brought, amendments now are to be technical in nature. And the proper motion would be to move for permission. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move for permission to offer Amendment L-015 to Senate Bill 068 and ask for the consideration from this body to offer this amendment. Uh, I believe you have briefly explained. Members, the motion before us is to grant permission to offer a third reading amendment. Representative Brown. Thank you, members. I asked for a no vote on this particular motion. Uh, we debated this bill not only in committee, but also on the floor on Friday. Uh, there were plenty of opportunities to offer amendments, so I ask for a no vote at this point. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Unfortunately, because I was in Pueblo, Colorado, attending the Republican district and state assemblies, I was not able to be here. Traditionally, in this chamber, speaking to many that have served before us, both representatives and senators, there was an unwritten rule during those times that no difficult, contentious pieces of legislation would be offered during assembly time. If it was during a work day... Representative Holtorf. So I was not here to offer those amendments, Madam Speaker. I think it's important to understand that it is unfair, in my humble opinion, Madam Speaker, to not have allowed me to be here based on some very um, extenuating circumstances that I cannot speak to in this chamber without violating statutory law. Representative Holtorf, we will proceed to the motion. The motion before us is permission to offer a third reading amendment to Senate Bill 68. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Luck, how do you vote? Uh, 
Members, the machine is still open. We are going to take a brief recess. The House will come back to order. Members, it is reflex to remember House rules um, more clearly sometimes than rules that would apply to a Senate bill. To be clear, we are still in the motion for permission to offer a third reading amendment. That does not change, but I want to clarify my earlier statement. When a Senate bill is here on third readings, you can offer a substantive amendment. So my apologies. Um, we are in the middle of the vote for permission, uh, so no more discussion, but uh, I do want you all to be aware that a substantive amendment would be allowed at this time. Representative Luck, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Luck votes yes. Representative Valdez, how do you vote? No. Representative Valdez votes no. Please close the machine. With 21 aye, 40 no, and four excuse, the permission to run a third reading amendment is lost. Representative Holtorf, we are back to the bill. This Thank you, is Madam Speaker. To the bill. And Representative Holtorf, you have five minutes and 40 seconds remaining. I was looking at six minutes and 20 seconds, but I know that uh, you have the official clock. Um, just to keep track, I'll set mine again. <clears throat> so it is a sad moment in time. Because as my grandmother lay dying, I would have loved to have her have the opportunity to meet with a medical mental health professional to have a discussion about how we turn the pages in those last pages of her life book. So she could have had that opportunity. You see, is it not fair? Is it not just? Is it not right for everybody to have those opportunities? We unfortunately have voted against that. Because in this bill, ladies and gentlemen, there is no consideration as we have somebody in this most critical time. And all of us are going to be there. We all get to get to that last chapter and we start to turn those last pages. Shouldn't you have the medical mental health practitioners available and afforded to you, particularly if you're going to do this medically assisted suicidal act, which means you're going to take your own life, or worse yet, someone is going to offer that for you if they're your caretaker, caregiver, or they're in charge of, as a loco parentis status, they're in charge of you. Should you not have that opportunity, is it not a right that should be afforded to you to at least have the consideration 
because in this bill there's none of that. It's just waved off. Now, unfortunately, before a physician used to be, and we didn't have a broken system. See, that's the thing that frustrates me. We didn't have a broken system. There's three elements that bother me. The first is no consideration for mental health counseling at all for these people. We've thrown that in the trash. Now you've all voted against that. And I'm saddened for those people. We'll spend millions of dollars on iMatters and for our youth, but we won't spend a nickel or any consideration for the elderly. Just push them off. That's what that vote said, in my mind. But worse yet, now we're not even going to have physicians do this. As they make the decision or someone else makes the decision to end their life, now we're going to have nurses do it, nurse practitioners. We've lowered that standard in this bill. And here's the worst thing, where we had a 14-day waiting period, two weeks, now we have a seven-day waiting period. So let's accelerate that journey. Let's just tear that last page out, throw it in the trash. Now it's going to be the second to the last page in their life book because we're going to shorten it to one week. I don't know why. Regardless of how hard and difficult that journey is, and I've seen it with my stepfather dying of cancer. I know how hard that is. I know the emotional pleas. Not only did I see it with my grandmother, I saw it with my stepfather as he died of colon cancer, stage four. And there was no man tougher, believe me. No man tougher. But shouldn't, you know, and thank God we have religion, and thank God we've got padres out there and pastors. God bless all of you that do God's work. Because we did have that element come. Now, they do have psychological training, ma'am. But wouldn't it have been nice for somebody like that in this space, a medical behavioral mental health practitioner? And oh, by the way, the other day we just threw the testing out on that one. But now, people that are licensed and trained to talk to these folks so they can get that comfort and understanding. And they can square and reconcile with their behavioral and mental health position. Representative Holtorf, you have one minute remaining. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not right. It is not right to give these people that have done everything for us, because your grandparents have done everything for you, in most cases as a son or daughter. And if they didn't, I weep for you. But I will tell you, these folks deserve this consideration. It is wrong and unjust to not give them that consideration. And that is one of the reasons, for many reasons, that I don't have time to mention. I will be a hard no on this bill. And I weep for those in this particular situation. But more importantly, I weep for those that will never get the behavioral mental health conversation that we are denying them in this legislation. It is wrong, absolutely and undeniably wrong. Representative Bradley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm gonna talk about the logistics behind this. I'm not gonna debate the, the subject of the bill. I'm gonna argue the logistics and the problems behind it because I brought three amendments as a proud healthcare worker to this bill in the effort of bipartisanship and they were all shot down on party line, no doubt. Um, so let me tell you about the problems with this bill and I'd like to thank Democrats for Life for helping me with this bill. While the law requires two physicians to document that there was no coercion, that the patient had the mental capacity to make a made decision and that a terminal illness with a six month prognosis, prognosis was present, there's no accountability in this law. CDPHE only collects demographic and diagnosis information, diagnosis information, which is published in an annual report, but does not have the authority to assess the veracity of the data or enforce compliance with the law. To claim that there has been no abuse of the law is simply speculation by advocates for the law and not based in fact. Currently required forms are not always submitted, including the patient consent to die. That's sometimes not included. That, that should cause pause for everyone. 
and attending physician forms. In physical therapy, you have to sign a consent for me to even put my hands on you, but now we know that patient consent forms aren't even being turned in. Wow. The laxity of compliance needs to be addressed because we don't know that patients are receiving the counseling and care of the End of Life Options Act promised. And according to Oregon, where they have 25 years of data collected, there are document after document after document that are, that are missing. And that causes concern. 20% of patient consent forms, 15% of attending physician forms, and 22% of consulting physician forms. This isn't just to get a vaccine. This is to die. And we're missing patient consent forms. There is no peer review to establish whether the requirements for a six month terminal diagnosis and alternative treatment options are being met or that the patients aren't suffering from a clinically significant depression or are mentally incapacitated. This kind of best practice is required in some jurisdictions that allow assisted suicide and euthanasia. And I wanna be very clear, my brother-in-law was diagnosed with a stage four glioblastoma. Most people don't live after weeks. Most people don't live after months, and no one really lives after years. If he had gone to one of these doctors, they would have said, you know what, you need to die. We're going to help you die. Let's be comforting. He has three small children. He's gone to Germany for his treatment. He has three years walking around healthy, coaching soccer, coaching football, coaching baseball, three years after his fatal diagnosis. Had he gone to one of these doctors, they would have told him, end your life now. These are the logistics we should be thinking about. The bill continues to mandate only a good faith effort to comply with the requirements of the End of Life Options Act rather than the more robust, this is my amendment, reasonable medical judgment. Life death decisions should not rely on good faith standards. When do we hold doctors to good faith standards versus reasonable medical judgment? We're assisting suicide and we're telling doctors they just have to have good faith in that. There is no requirement to document complications for administration of the overdose drugs or the time till unconsciousness and death. These drugs are all being used off-label per the FDA. They're off-label. That's why they keep changing these drugs month after month after month, because they're off-label. There are no randomized trials and only limited case series that report the efficacy of these changing made regimens not requiring the documentation of the procedure complications slow the process necessary to improve the made regimen. This is a best practice mandated in other US jurisdictions. Randomized control trials are the gold standard. That's what we base all of our medical decisions on. And there's not yet one in place for this. There are inadequate referrals, less than 1% for mental health consultation based on the evidence that a high percentage of patients, almost 50% seeking assisted suicide, are depressed. Shouldn't we require documentation of the performance of a simple depression and mental capacity clinical tool? Another rejected. One simple thing, make sure these patients are mentally capable. And we couldn't even agree on that. When my kids go to the pediatrician, they have to fill out one of these tests. When I go to my primary care once a year, I have to fill out one of these tests. But to die in Colorado, you don't have to. You can seek physician-assisted suicide and not be deemed whether you are clinically depressed or not. One tool. One of the doctors came and testified that he had helped assist in suicide. 22 patients. I raised my hand. How many did you refer for a mental health screening? And he said, zero. If that doesn't scare you guys, I don't think anything will. There is no state-mandated oversight to ensure that patients seeking assisted suicide aren't being coerced for financial or other reasons. The person taking you for your assisted suicide can stand to be your beneficiary, can stand to gain from you financially. There is not a single safeguard in place to make sure that the person helping you make this decision isn't going to inherit everything you have. Since physicians are asked to falsify the death certificate for patients dying from assisted suicide, there is no accurate way to fully assess the quantity or the quality of the practice of assisted suicide in Colorado. We should change this so that we can pursue public health research into assisted suicide and its effects on Colorado. There's been no public health effort to quantify the impact of assisted suicide on non-assisted suicide rates, especially in high-risk teen populations. In the last three legislative sessions alone, 
This assembly has given $33 million for suicide prevention and another 900,000 has already passed one house state Senate committee this year. So we're spending $33 million for suicide prevention and now we're going to allow a doctor or a nurse practitioner. I mean, we're just gonna keep loosening it up. Maybe a medical assistant can do it next to determine whether you have a terminal prognosis or not. There is no requirement that the drugs utilized to ensure death are stored safely. This is another amendment I tried to pass. We sit here in this legislative body and I gotta lock up my firearm safely in my car now, but you can have a thousand times the amount of normal morphine that could kill hundreds of people and you can just leave that out on your counter. And the bill sponsor said, well, that somebody could get into your medicine cabinet, then we're gonna have to ban medicine. This is a thousand times the legal limit of morphine. This can kill hundreds of people. This isn't a cardiac pill. This isn't an anti-anxiety. It's a thousand times the normal amount. Nurse practitioners serve a vital role in our medical system, but aren't as qualified to make determinations for seriously ill patients regarding advanced therapeutic options. And just to let you know, Medicare does not allow nurse practitioners to establish terminal diagnosis, but they can aid in physician-assisted suicide. I think we're gonna be big, in big trouble with federal law. In Colorado, many physicians prescribing the drug overdose don't have a prior relationship with the patient. So can you imagine, I want you to be very clear, this is not your primary care that's authorizing this. This is not the nurse practitioner. This is someone you look up on the web and you go to them without a thorough history of what you're going through, your family history or anything, just on the sole purpose that they're gonna help you die without even understanding your background, medications, they're just here to give you the meds. As access to assisted suicide should not be easy. Impulsive decisions will be facilitated when the waiting period is abbreviated. Patients very near the end of life are not capable of understanding or implementing the decision to pursue suicide. This makes them susceptible to individuals who apply coercion to push them towards suicide for financial and other reasons. Participation in assisted suicide has increased exponentially 355% since 2016 in Colorado, which contradicts the characterization that access is difficult. 355% and we have no guardrails. Come to Colorado, we'll help you die. Maybe we should have a license plate for that next year. Maybe we should bring a license plate. Representative Bradley, you have one minute Thank remaining. you. Suicide is not the best way to die. A peaceful, comfortable death surrounded by family. The overdose regime that is prescribed is constantly changing, which suggests advocates are still trying to find a regimen that works without side effects. We know that jurisdictions such as Oregon, the death can sometimes take hours to days and can be complicated by nausea, vomiting, delirium, and seizures. There are countless stories of good deaths of patients surrounded by family through quality palliative hospice care. And I will urge you, palliative care is only available in 28% of rural hospitals. And now we're gonna make this accessible versus giving patients palliative care, which should happen in rural Colorado, not aiding them in suicide. I urge a no vote on this bill. Representative Bottoms. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I do disagree with the concept of the bill, and I also agree with, disagree with the, um, the application. I, I don't see a reason for this. We are, this is already possible in Colorado, which I strongly disagree with, but now we're just making it shorter, and we're giving nurse practitioners the ability to do this. That, that makes no sense to me. We're, we're opening this up, we're, we're opening the gates up to have so many wrongful deaths in the process. Um, I do remember this coming up about, uh, about 12, 13 years ago in a, um, in a town hall uh, speech that was given where, where um, President Obama was explaining Obamacare to us and the question came up, well, eventually will we just um, make it easier for older people to die? And, uh, and the explanation was if you have a heart attack at, at um, 80 years old, then maybe you don't need uh, anything to help you live longer. And uh, this is exactly what this is. This was, at the time, people called this death panels, that this is going to be turned over to death panels. This, this is what it is. This is, the, this is the next step in that evolution, is now we've got nurse practitioners being, being the death panels. That, that makes no sense to me. 
And uh, this is the space. I, I, I do understand, I understand the, some of the heart behind, not this bill, but the heart behind why people are saying this. This is the arena that I walk in. As a pastor, this is what I've done for 30 years. I, I know I've spent way more time than anybody in this room with people that are at their last moments of, of life and people in the last six months or, or a year. And I've, I've held people's hands by the dozens upon dozens when they take their last breath. I do understand this concept. And I've had family members ask me about this. And I've had people that have been uh, given the, some kind of um, prognosis that they've only got weeks to live and they come to me. What about this? But I also have seen many people, again, innumerable amounts of people that have been told you have two weeks to live and they live five years. You have, you have a month to live and they live 10 years. I can count that off all day long, and that's not even within the realm that I also interact with, which is the supernatural. That's just the natural realm. And I've also seen people who have been given this diagnosis, and, and God heals them, and they live a few decades after that. But, but we're saying we know better than life. We know better than the gift of life. We know better than what's happening on a physical and, and slash spiritual level. We, we have the ability to play God. And we're going to play God by putting these bills together and saying, well, we're just going to make this um, possible. And, and then, you know what, let's just make it so easy that anybody that wants to commit suicide can do this. And we've got the, I know we've got the rules in the bill that says um, they have to be terminally ill and all these different kind of things, but we're letting nurse practitioners make that decision. This is outside the bounds. It's amazing when we start playing God how easy it is to en- encompass everything, everything. From conception to the end, we're, we're the ones playing God with all of this. Life is something that we don't have the ability to give. God gives life, and we, but we think we have the ability to control it, and we don't. And we're playing around an arena that we do not belong in. This is not where we should exist. And this is, this is way too far for us to be having these discussions. This is, um, this is a bill that should go away today. Representative Taggart. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is a really difficult topic for me to talk about and that I'm torn in what about what I'm about to say. I have lost three friends to Lou Gehrig's disease. The most recent, please sit, you scare me. Uh, The most recent colleague I lost to Lou Gehrig's helped me design one of the most successful products that our company ever marketed. We worked side by side on this invention for the better part of nine months. And I watched him, how he deteriorated from a physical standpoint, almost on a weekly basis because we met every week while we were designing it together. For those of you that don't know Lou Gehrig's disease, it doesn't affect your mind. This man was brilliant. I was just thrilled he would work with me, because I'm not. And he told me, along with his physician over that nine months, what was gonna happen. And I watched it happen. And we worked together all the way to to his end. I respect my colleagues on this discussion. Lou Gehrig's, there is no cure. To my knowledge, I don't know anyone that has lived through Lou Gehrig's disease. My friend did not. 
if it was his physician, which Mark did not take his life, but if his physician had said to me and had said to his wife that the end was very close, I would have understood his decision because I watched how his body continued to deteriorate to the point that in Luke Gehrig's you have no control of your body whatsoever. But where I have a problem with this bill is that it takes it beyond the attending physician. And I don't doubt that a nurse practitioner could also have been a large help to this man during this time when he knew he was going to die. But that nurse practitioner should not have the authority at the same level that his attending physician had. I wouldn't have a problem with this bill if it said a nurse practitioner with the approval of the attending physician, I would not necessarily be against that because of my witnessing this. But I have a problem with the physician not ultimately being the decision maker on this. And I'm sorry, I can't vote yes on, on this bill in spite of the fact that, as you can probably tell, the loss of three friends and this one in particular that we work so closely together still weighs on my heart. Thank you. Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, I was also not here for the second reading debate and have some things I'd like to share about this particular bill. I don't know how many of you <clears throat> have witnessed the death of a loved one. I had a beautiful childhood, one that, to tell you the truth, you think back on it, and it really was the good old days. I had five great aunts. All of their husbands had passed away before my brother and I were even born. <clears throat> and they lived through the Great Depression and through World War II. Their kids were grown and had left the Delta area. And they definitely spoiled my brother and I. Each one of them lived into their late 90s, and three of them well past age 100. And as a close-knit family, you watch as, unfortunately, old age takes its toll because there's two things that we can never get out of in this life. One is death and taxes. Um, <laughs> but... I'll never forget um, the day we were called to the hospital for my Aunt Clara. She was 104. She's the woman that we love to play cards with, even when she had lost her eyesight to macular degeneration. And we had to tell her the cards in her hand. She could still remember the placement and still win games of rummy. And her doctor said, it's going to happen. And we can stop giving her water. And dehydration will take its toll. The organs will start to shut down. She had been on oxygen for many years. So we can remove the oxygen. And that coupled with Removing of water will also force the shutting down of the organs. And it will then be only a matter of time. We sat there as a family. We all held her hand. And it happened. When 
we want to do things differently? I don't know. And, and please, you don't need to stand. You know, I really don't know if the policy in this bill would be in place, if we would do things differently. It has to be up to each and every family to make that decision. For us as legislators, I don't think we're competent. I don't like moving it away from the physician. That to me is a person of great authority and great trust for most people. And I don't like the removal of certain disclosures. But what I can tell you is oftentimes when it reaches that point, the person is also not in a position to understand. And they're not in a position to know. And that's why I have trouble with this bill. It's at a level where I would much rather do what we can to make our loved ones as comfortable as possible right up until the end. And show them love. And that's why I'm going to be a no vote. Representative Hartsook. Good morning, Madam Speaker, and thank you. Good morning. Uh, that's going to be tough to follow. My other colleague threw me on the bus and said, you go first. <laughs> so at least we're smiling. I spoke against this on Friday. Half of us were not here, either for attending assemblies, but the chamber was kind of empty. As I proceed through my thoughts here, I think we should ask ourselves, where are we going with this? We have bulletin statements that talk about, you've heard the comments about a nurse practitioner can do the same thing as a physician, but not in any other medical procedure can they do that. We're removing the requirement that the individual must be a resident of this state. There's all kinds of implications with that. Is, does this then become the destination state for assisted suicide? And we're reducing the waiting period from 15 days to 48 hours. We're saying that somebody who's in that position must be of sound mind to make the decision. My parents retired, and they traveled the country, and then they ended up living in Oregon, just outside of Salem, a little place called Woodburn. And that's where they, they spent their retirement years. And I would go out and visit, and I was still in the Army, traveling all over the world. And of course, as they got older, I, I tried to get out there, but you know, the Army had a habit of sending me all kinds of places. And my mom being my mom, anybody's mom, is always worried about you. And she'd always say, take care of yourself. She'd always say, come back. And I did. But some of my friends did not. So, no, no, sit, sit down, sit down, please. Thank you, though, but please sit. So I've seen death on the battlefield. As you know, my wife's a surgeon. She's seen it extensively in the hospitals. I watched my mom die via a phone. 
because I was not allowed at the time of COVID to go to Oregon. So I watched her die on a phone. But before all of that had happened, I asked her. She used, to, she used to joke, she said, getting old is not for the weak. She had a lot of, I mean, her health was pretty good, but like most people, when you get into your mid-80s and pushing 90, things start to go wrong with your body. That, that's just a fact. I remember one time, <laughs> about a year before she passed away, I was out there. And uh, it's been a while since she's been able to get down to church. And so I uh, said, well, you know, come on, Mom, we'll take you down to church. So we, I drove around down there, and I went looking for where's the pastor at. And next day, my mom was off walking through the church and just looking around everything where she had always gone for, for every Sunday. Of course, we found the pastor, and they, they just sit there and had a conversation. I would assume from the conversations I had with my mom that she knew the end was getting closer and closer. She used to say, it's okay, I'm ready to go. Thank you. She used to say, I'm ready to go. She also said she's not ready to go before her time. Whatever that time was, she knew God knew. I did not. And she lived in Oregon where, of course, end of life had been around for, for decades. She was very strong in her faith. But she said, the good Lord will take me when when it's my time. Now, I don't know when it's everyone's time. I don't know when it's my time. But I kept that with me throughout deployments and saying things. Because my mom was steadfast as you lived life until it was your time. There was no point in hurrying it up. Did she miss riding around in her Jeep? Absolutely. But she wasn't ready to give up. And I think as a society, it becomes very dangerous when we put recommendations, put allowances that allow people to hurry up that process because you do not know what is yet to come. I did not know that I would be saying goodbye to her on the phone. I did not know my kids got to say goodbye to her on the phone. I did not know that was going to happen. But as the end approached and the doctor said, These, this is what you will see, we watched that transpire over the last couple of days. I think it's a very dangerous path that as a society we go down when we start injecting ourselves into what will be the end. I know many people have different beliefs, but I would ask you to consider, we cannot see beyond death. We cannot see beyond what's going to happen but we can continue to live for what we have in front of us right now.
We choose life because we want to see another sunrise as we did this morning. We want to see our kids, our parents. We want to see our friends. I cannot support or advocate for ending that early. I would ask that you think long and hard about where we are going with this as a society. Rep. Hartsook, you have a minute remaining. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Where are we going as a society down this road? It is one I would recommend strongly against going down. Thank you. Representative Frizzell. I always follow a tall person. This is a very emotional topic for so many of us. I am befuddled that we are seeking to normalize suicide for some while we turn around and try to prevent it for others. I think that that's confusing. It's confusing to me. I may differ a little bit from some of my colleagues in that I think it's okay to make some decisions about what you want to do, um, to be in control of how you go out. I just don't agree with this particular model that's been created in this legislation. Um, my mother was diagnosed with cancer and she decided that she didn't want treatment. I think she had known for a long time that she was very sick. She hated doctors, she hated hospitals, and she was by golly gonna do this on her own terms at home. After six weeks, she passed, but it was a rough six weeks. I was her caregiver in her home. But I will tell you that there is an amazing, extraordinary, sacred space being with someone that closely as they pass. I hope to never experience anything quite like it again. And she did it her way. And I respect that. I respect her decision. I didn't agree with it. I didn't like it. In fact, I hated it. But I had to respect it. I worry about this bill. It feels like we are trying to emulate a state that, candidly, I don't think that we should be looking at as a great beacon um, in many things. I mean, but at least Oregon asks, why are you making this decision? And, you know, is it you don't have adequate pain control? Is it that you are losing autonomy? And, and we have statistics. 90% of the patients in Oregon listed that they were concerned about a diminished ability to enjoy life. 90% were worried about loss of autonomy. 72% were worried about loss of dignity. 48% were worried about being a burden on their family. I think that 
those numbers are really interesting because there are things that you can do to help them. These, some of these problems are solvable and shouldn't be a reason to end your life. Only 28% said that it was inadequate pain control. Um, I also worry, I mean, we've seen this in our high schools in Castle Rock, um, where you have one, one of our precious kiddos decide to end their life, and then sure enough, within a short period of time, you'll have three others. There's a name for it, it's called suicide contagion. And there's information from, from Oregon about that too. I'm just going to read this really quickly. And I didn't bring my glasses, so bear with me. The publicly available data from Oregon, however, revealed that in the months surrounding um, this gentleman's high-profile death in no November of 2014, a number of similarly situated individuals in Oregon who ended their lives by lethal injection more than doubled. Furthermore, from 1998, which is when they started recording the data, to 2013, the number of lethal prescriptions written each year increased at an average of 12.1 percent. During 2014 and 2015, however, this increase doubled, suggesting that high-profile assisted death leads to more assisted death. Although the data do not prove that an increase in assisted deaths causes more non-assisted suicide, this study found that the legalization of assisted suicide had been associated with an increase of total suicides. I'm going to go back to my original statement. I'm concerned that we are seeking to normalize suicide while fighting against it for others. The thing is, is I know from my own experience and with others that patients who have cancer almost always have some level of depression. And they just, because they have this combination of cancer and depression, they tend to experience more physical symptoms from the cancer. It's, it's an evil cycle. And I have to ask, why aren't we treating that? I think that my colleague from Akron's bill, or sorry, amendment that he brought earlier around mental health assessments is an important one and something that should be considered. I'm also concerned about this medication because it's not being tracked in this bill. It's just distributed and off it goes. You don't know what happens to any unused medication and I think that's a problem. Members, I appreciate your consideration and attention. This is a very quiet chamber for a very somber topic. We need to, we need to honor this process. I feel that we can do better, and I unfortunately will be a no vote today. Thank you. Representative Brown. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The House. The House will stand in a brief recess.
The House will come back to order. <laughs> Representative Brown, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I, I want to thank all of my colleagues who have come to the well today and to speak on this bill. Um, it's a deeply personal topic. Um, when I was presenting this bill in committee. Representative Brown, my apologies. We are still having technical difficulties. We will stand in a brief recess.
The House will come back to order. <laughs> Members, I apologize for the interruption. Because of the power outage, we had some technical dif difficulties, but we are now back on track. Representative Brown. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just uh, want to thank all of my colleagues uh, from both sides of the aisle who have spoken on this bill, both on second reading and third reading. Um, when I started down this path of, of carrying this bill, someone told me that um, the stories that you would hear, not only your own sort of stories, but the stories that you would hear from other people will be amazing. And that is really true. I am deeply, deeply moved by the stories of loss from so many people from both sides of our, of our chamber. Um, to me, this bill is about a deeply personal decision. And I, I can't really speak about what has gone on in other states like Oregon. Um, uh, what, but what I do know is about our program and about this bill. And I know that in order for folks to qualify for this program, they have to be terminally ill. They are dying. And they must, those, that illness, and that diagnosis must be verified by two different doctors. There are questions that doctors ask. And it is important also to know that depression screening is an important best practice in any, in any healthcare setting, any, any primary care especially setting. I do not believe that anyone is being denied care for depression by this bill. I think it's important to note that the bill, both that was passed by the voters and this bill continues that, requires people to be mentally capable. And if there's any doubt about that, the, pr the practitioner, the physician must refer that person to an additional uh, screening by a psychologist. I heard the word suicide used a lot in the well today. To me, this is, this is not suicide. These are people that are dying. And they are choosing to live out their final moments on their own terms. There is no evidence that anyone has ever been taken advantage of by our program in Colorado. It is working as intended because we have put appropriate safeguards in place. And this bill does not remove those safeguards. It only makes it easier for folks to access this program while maintaining those safeguards. I heard some conversations about safe storage and the importance of safely storing this medication. It is true that doctors prescribe all kinds of incredibly toxic medications that if in, in the wrong hands of a child or other could be fatal. No one has ever died that I'm aware of or that has ever been reported from improperly stored medicine from this program. This is not a death panel. There is no panel. This is a person grappling with their own mortality, grappling with the choice of how to live out their final days. People should have the freedom to choose how they live out their final days in consultation with their health care provider and with their loved ones. It's a deeply personal decision. And one of the reasons why I carry this bill by myself 
is because of that personal decision. It is as a symbol of the choice that people are having to make on their own while surrounded by beautiful colleagues, beautiful friends, beautiful family members who are here and supporting them. The reasons that my colleagues have shared that this is not a program that they would feel comfortable participating in are beautiful and completely valid. But that does not mean that other people should not be afforded that choice. Every person deserves the ability to live out their final moments in dignity. And I would ask you for an I vote on this bill. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the motion before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 68 on third reading and final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Luck, how do you vote? No. Representative Luck votes no. Representative Valdez, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Valdez votes yes. Please close the machine. With 41 aye, 20 no, and four excused, Senate Bill 68 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Representative Valdez, co-sponsors. Please <clears throat> close the machine. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move to lay over the balance of the calendar to Wednesday, April 10th, 2024. Seeing no objection, the balance of the calendar will be laid over until Wednesday, April 10th, 2024. Announcements, Representative Sirota. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, House Appropriations will be meeting on Wednesday at 8.30, and uh, please note we'll be meeting in room uh, 112 downstairs uh, to hear the bills listed in your calendar. Again, that's Wednesday at 8.30 in room 112. Representative Froelich. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Transportation, Housing, and Local Government Committee will meet in 10 minutes. That's 11.05 at LSBA to hear Senate Bill 65. Representative Weissman. Thanks, Madam Speaker. I have two announcements. The first is that the Judiciary Committee will meet starting at 1.30 in the Old State Library. We have two items on our calendar. The first is House Resolution 1006. The next is House Bill 1303. The second announcement is that having consulted with the Office of the Majority Leader, I've received permission to be excused Wednesday, uh, starting Wednesday for the rest of the week. So approved. Representative Doherty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Health and Human Services will meet in room 112, 10 minutes upon adjournment. We were, will he hear the bills in the following order, 1431, Senate Bill 10, uh, House Bill 1327, and House Bill 1377. Thanks. Representative Kipp. Hi, I just want to be clear, this late in the session, committee schedules are moving around. Energy and environment will not be meeting on Wednesday. The bills that we were hearing on Wednesday will now be here on Thursday, and we'll announce those tomorrow. Thank you. Representative Herod. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Speaker. I just want to give a quick announcement. Um, we are welcoming representatives from the German Embassy today from Washington, D.C., uh, and the Bertelsmann Foundation. Uh, they were here on the House floor, but they did have to leave. Um, we are a part of their town hall series with the goal of gaining insights with a stronger understanding of the current state of politics in Colorado. Um, they will be meeting in the minority offices, and so for both sides, since we missed the, the time at 10 o'clock, uh, if you would like to meet with the German Embassy, please uh, welcome and come to the minority offices uh, to greet them and tell them all about how great Colorado is. Thanks. Thank you, Rep. Two, Herod. 212. 212. Thank you, Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Speaker.
I have one announcement. Representative Lukens will substitute for Representative English in Health and Human Services for today only. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move the House stand in recess until later today. The House will stand in recess until later today.